Can victims actually solve their own murders from beyond the grave? How is it possible for the dead to point to their killers and ensure that justice prevails? In this video, we're going to dive into three of the craziest stories where the victims somehow managed to solve their own murders from beyond the grave. But before we jump in, the details in these stories are graphic and may not be suitable for all audiences, so viewer discretion is strongly advised. As always, remember to hit the like button, share the video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications to stay up to date with the channel. All right, let's dive into the stories. Suzanne Capper was only 16 years old when she tragically died under truly horrific circumstances. Her story has gone down as one of the most sadistic murder cases in British history. Suzanne had planned to move in with her mother, who was prepping her new apartment for their reunion on Christmas Eve. Unfortunately, Suzanne, a quiet and friendless teenager, had formed attachments to the few people she knew despite how they mistreated her. This led to her untimely and brutal death, a profoundly disturbing event. Born in 1976 in Greater Manchester, England, Suzanne Jane Capper was often described by her mother as very forgiving. Suzanne and her sister Michelle grew up without knowing their biological father, who was under the care of their mother, Elizabeth Dunbar, and their stepfather, John Capper. The family faced a difficult period when the couple separated when Suzanne turned 14. Following the split, Suzanne and Michelle moved frequently, sometimes staying with their mother, stepfather, family friends, or under the care of local authorities. This period of instability eventually led Suzanne to live in the home of Jean Powell. During one of her transient phases, Suzanne's connection to Jean began through a serendipitous meeting with Clifford Pook, Jean Powell's younger brother. One day, Clifford Pook was sitting by the road, upset over a problem with his girlfriend, when Suzanne Capper approached to check on him. This led Suzanne to meet Jean Powell shortly afterward. Jean, who was a decade older than Suzanne, and was currently living with her three children in a rundown house near Suzanne's stepfather's home, quickly became a significant figure in her life. Suzanne often stayed over, volunteering to babysit Jean's children mostly without pay, and she often missed school. Suzanne began spending considerable time with Jean and her circle while her family remained largely unaware of the dire circumstances unfolding. Her mother later discovered that John had pulled Suzanne out of school to work as a cleaner in a local building, allowing her to keep only a small fraction of her earnings. When Suzanne's family confronted John, she threatened severe retaliation. The situation escalated further when a new neighbor, Bernadette McNeely, moved in, marking the beginning of more severe troubles. 24-year-old Bernadette McNeely has three children of her own, and she lived only a few houses down from Jean, but by 1992, she has all but moved into Jean's house, along with her children. As the Independent reports, the dilapidated houses had morphed into a den of drugs, parties, and sex. Jean and Bernadette were weighing amphetamines in the kitchens, dealing them in the living rooms, selling stolen car parts, and sleeping with a slew of people who came through the houses looking for drugs, one of them being a 16-year-old named Anthony Dudson, who entered a sexual relationship with both Powell and McNeely, as well as Suzanne Capper. The house was also frequented by Jean's 29-year-old ex-husband, Glenn Powell, 26-year-old heroin user Jeffrey Lee, and Clifford Pook. Around late November 1992, at one of their drug-fueled parties, Suzanne and Jean met Mohammed Youssef, who was a friend of a friend. Suzanne suggested Jean sleep with Youssef, which Jean immediately rejected. This would turn out to be a grave mistake for Suzanne. Suzanne once told her neighbors that Jean Powell had restrained her for four days, but no one believed her story. This disbelief marked the beginning of a series of disputes that culminated in her tragic demise. In a horrible episode, after Bernadette McNeely, Anthony Dudson, and Jean and Glenn Powell contracted pubic lice, they irrationally accused Suzanne. Driven by fury over this unfounded accusation, they humiliated her by making her shave her pubic hair and clean it up afterwards. 
The next day, Suzanne was forcibly taken to Bernadette McNeely's previous home, away from any children who might witness the horrors that followed. She was bound to a bed frame with various cords, ropes, electric cables, belts, and chains. As her captors injected themselves with amphetamines, they embarked on a relentless and sadistic torture session. McNeely, who was heavily dosed on drugs, ominously took on the persona of Chucky from the horror film Child's Play. Clifford Pook and Jeffrey Lee also joined in on the abuse. They gagged Suzanne with socks to muffle her screams, bathed her in harsh disinfectants that burned her skin, and inflicted numerous cigarette burns on her body. Hours before her death, McNeely injected Suzanne with amphetamines, placed headphones over her ears, and blasted rave music with the haunting repetition of the phrase, I'm Chucky. Wanna play? In a cruel final act, they removed two of her front teeth to hinder identification as they plotted to end her life. Suzanne Capper was placed in the trunk of a stolen car and driven 13 miles to a remote wooded area near Stockport by Jeffrey Lee, Anthony Dudson, and Bernadette McNeely. Once there, they dragged her through a thick underbrush to a clearing. Barely clothed and vulnerable, Suzanne was doused in gasoline by McNeely. Jean Powell later described the harrowing scene at her trial. There was a sudden flash. I turned back to see Suzanne engulfed in flames, her screams piercing the night. I felt completely numb and terrified. Believing they had left her to die, they callously sang, burn baby burn as they returned home. Despite the brutal attack, Suzanne Capper was not yet defeated. With remarkable resilience, she crawled to a nearby road where a passing driver found her and rushed her to the hospital. Before succumbing to her injuries and falling into a coma from which she would not awaken, Suzanne gave the police crucial details about her identity, the ordeal she endured, and the identities of those responsible for her torment. The Manchester Evening News later reported that Jean Powell, Glenn Powell, and Bernadette McNeely received life sentences for the murder of Suzanne Capper. However, McNeely's sentence was later reduced by 12 months due to her behavior as a model prisoner and apparent remorse. Jeffrey Lee was released from prison in 1998, Clifford Pook in 2001, and Anthony Dudson in 2013. Suzanne's mother reflected on her daughter's nature, noting her forgiving spirit and tendency to handle problems independently. In her final act, Suzanne bravely identified her attackers, ensuring justice was served. Audriana Zimmerman, a 19-year-old Florida resident who lived in a trailer park and was born on April 13, 1990. Though not widely documented, her life was marked by tumultuous relationships with three of her neighbors, 39-year-old Tina Brown, Tina's 16-year-old daughter Brittany Miller, and 27-year-old Heather Lee. The interactions between Audriana and her neighbors, particularly Tina and Brittany, frequently escalated into violent confrontations. Tina accused Audriana of slashing her tires, while Audriana alleged that Tina had smashed her car window, had her boyfriend wrongfully arrested, and reported her to the Florida Department of Children and Families for inadequate child care. Heather often became a peacemaker, stepping in to defuse physical fights between Brittany and Audriana. Brittany attempted to strike Audriana after discovering she had relations with her boyfriend. Audriana defended herself with a stun gun. Later that day, Brittany informed her mother, Tina, that Audriana had used a stun gun on her. Tina said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. A few days later, Tina allegedly invited Audriana to her home to reestablish their friendship. Tina, Brittany, Heather, and Brittany's 13-year-old pal were all in the trailer. Tina and Heather were in the kitchen when Heather demonstrated how to use a stun gun properly. Brittany then drew her pal aside and stated, We're going to kill Adriana. Don't tell anyone, or we'll kill you too. After 9 p.m., Adriana Zimmerman walked into the trailer expecting a friendly conversation. However, the situation quickly deteriorated when Tina suddenly attacked her with a stun gun multiple times. 
As Adriana lost control of her muscles and collapsed, Tina relentlessly continued to shock her. Adriana's screams for help filled the trailer until Tina dragged her into the bathroom. To silence her cries, Brittany struck Adriana in the face, and Heather gagged her with a sock. But the assault wouldn't stop there. They forced the incapacitated Adriana into the trunk of Tina's car. All four women entered the vehicle together and drove off into the night. They drove about a mile from the trailer park to a secluded clearing in the woods. After pulling Adriana from the trunk, Tina and Brittany chased her down as she tried to escape but stumbled in the dark. They wrestled her to the ground. Tina continuously shocked her with a stun gun while Brittany assaulted her with a crowbar and then switched to punching. Eventually, Tina ceased using the stun gun, returned to the car to fetch a can of gasoline, and doused Adriana with it before setting her ablaze. The three women watched as flames enveloped her, with Brittany shouting in excitement, burn, burn, burn. Minutes later, they left the scene. On their drive back, Brittany realized she had left her shoes and the taser behind, but Tina decided against retrieving them. Upon returning to the trailer, Tina and Brittany disposed of their bloodied clothes while Heather discarded her stained shoes. Brittany then confided in her 13-year-old friend, revealing that they had set Adriana on fire. Brittany and her friend took Tina's car to seek medical treatment for Brittany's injured hand. While en route to the hospital, Brittany discarded a trash bag in a dumpster and tried to clean the bloodstains from the car. Meanwhile, a short distance from where Adriana was set on fire, Terence Hendrick was outside his home when he heard a faint voice calling for help. He soon saw a figure approaching. It was Adriana. She reached his doorstep, asking for assistance while sitting on the front steps. Terence observed her severe head injuries, her lack of clothing, the overpowering smell of gasoline, and her skin, charred to the extent that her race was indiscernible. At 9.24 p.m., an EMT arrived and found Adriana rocking back and forth on the porch, her arms extended straight out. The severity of her burns, covering about 90% of her body and causing her skin to peel away, made it initially unclear whether she was wearing any clothes. She also suffered from severe head trauma and had a significantly injured jaw. The EMT noted that the extensive damage from the burns hindered immediate medical intervention. Despite her critical condition, Adriana remained conscious and coherent, identifying Tina and Heather as her attackers. She provided her address and the address of her assailants, and she urgently requested the EMT check on her children. An ambulance took Adriana to a local hospital minutes after the EMT arrived. En route, she repeatedly asked about her chances of recovery and recounted that Tina, Brittany, and Heather had doused her with gasoline and set her on fire despite a seeming reconciliation. She was initially stabilized at the local hospital before being transferred to a burn unit in Alabama. Armed with the details provided by Adriana, police quickly arrested Tina and Heather and Brittany was taken into custody the following morning as she left the hospital. Although the women were temporarily released from jail, Tina confided in her friend Pamela Valley that they had assaulted Adriana, taken her to a field, set her on fire, and left without looking back. Tina later mentioned to Pamela that Adriana was still alive and suggested that Pamela help her finish the job. Pamela refused and subsequently informed the police of this conversation. Tragically, Adriana Zimmerman succumbed to her injuries 16 days after the attack, on April 9, 2010. Following her death, the charges against the woman were escalated to murder. The official cause of death was listed as multiple thermal injuries, and the manner of death was confirmed as a homicide. At the scene of the crime, police found several crucial pieces of evidence, including Brittany's shoes, a blood-stained stun gun, bloodied paper, a colorful hair weave, a crowbar, and a pool of blood. Further investigation revealed blood on the passenger seat headrest of Tina's car, which matched Adriana's DNA. The blood on the stun gun was also matched to Tina Brown. 
When interviewed on the night of the attack, police observed that Tina was missing a large section of hair corresponding to the hair found at the scene. There's old scars on there? Yeah, I have a puppy. Okay, and what's this right here? That little scratch there? This? Yeah. I have a puppy. Okay, and your puppy caused that? Look, I'm going to move here. Got your chin? Okay. Nothing new. All right. So, where were you tonight? At Heather's. At Heather's house? Well, I was at home. My, my daughter's braiding my hair, so I was at home, but... Um, it started hurting and her little friend started coming by so um, Heather said she was gonna cook so I went down there and she was cooking uh, fish and french fries and then we just started watching movies okay and um, did you go anywhere from there mm -mm. you were there all night until the cops came up there during Tina Brown's trial much was made of her troubled background characterized as abusive and destructive nonetheless the jury found her guilty of first-degree murder. Five days following the conviction, they unanimously recommended the death penalty, and she was sentenced to death on September 28, 2012. Tina expressed remorse to the victim's family, acknowledging Adriana's dreadful death and her role in it, admitting that Adriana did not deserve such a fate. When asked about the motive behind the crime, Tina claimed that Heather Lee had spurred the attack accusing Adriana of reporting her to Crime Stoppers. Heather Lee claimed she was home cooking all night and denied involvement in the crime. However, multiple witnesses contradicted her, recalling statements she made about setting Adriana on fire. Heather was eventually sentenced to 25 years in prison for second-degree murder after accepting a plea deal to avoid the death penalty and agreeing to testify against Tina. Brittany Miller, only 16 at the time of the crime, pleaded no contest to murder and kidnapping. Legally, she couldn't face the death penalty due to her age, and in 2013, she received a life sentence without parole. In March 2022, an attempt by Tina's lawyers to appeal her death sentence was rejected by the court. This appeal was based on new claims of false testimony, with one witness admitting to lying under threat from Heather. However, the court found the motion untimely and stated that the overwhelming evidence against Tina as the ringleader and main perpetrator would not have altered her sentence. Before we cover the last entry of this video, if you are enjoying the story so far, please remember to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Now back to the final story. Teresita Bassa, born in 1929 in the Philippines, was passionate about music from an early age. In pursuit of a music career, she moved to Chicago in her 30s to attend Indiana University, though she initially struggled to find music-related work. After graduating, Teresita transitioned to healthcare, securing a job at Edgewater Hospital, where she rose to become a respiratory therapist. Despite the career change, her dream persisted. She worked hospital shifts by day, pursued a PhD in music by night, and even taught piano to local children for free. Her resilience and dedication were evident as she tirelessly worked toward her goals, never wavering in the face of challenges. A neighbor, alarmed by thick black smoke emanating from Teresita's apartment, called the fire department. Upon entry, they discovered the fire was contained mainly in the living room, where a mattress was burning. Underneath it laid a tragic sight, Teresita's lifeless body, nude with a knife embedded in her chest. Identified swiftly, the 48-year-old's death was pinpointed as a severe stab wound, with no signs of an assault found during the autopsy. Despite the disarray in the apartment, no evidence of theft was found, challenging the initial theory of a robbery gone awry. Searching for leads, the police uncovered a note written by Teresita about obtaining theater tickets for someone with the initials A.S. When her friends and relatives were questioned, none could shed light on the identity of A.S. Moreover, Teresita had mentioned to a friend during a phone call that she was expecting a male guest, suspected to be A.S., adding layers to the mystery surrounding her murder. Mrs. Chua was profoundly affected by Teresita's death experiencing an unusual type of grief. She reported being visited by Teresita in her dreams, 
initially dismissing these visions as shared memories of a lost one. However, the dreams intensified six months later, seemingly possessing Mrs. Chua. Compelled by the disturbing dreams, the police called the couple to the station. One particular afternoon, Dr. Chua noticed his wife was distressed while sleeping on the couch. He approached to comfort her, but she was visibly tormented as if trapped in a nightmare. Upon waking, her first troubled words were an urgent plea for help, claiming that the man responsible for Teresita's murder was still free. Mrs. Chua began to mumble in Tagalog during her sleep, a language she seldom spoke, and her voice sounded unlike her own. Dr. Chua, puzzled, asked who she was, and she claimed to be Teresita Basa. Upon waking, Mrs. Chua remembered nothing. The couple initially wrote off the experience as a mere nightmare, yet the occurrences persisted, pushing them toward the brink of insanity. Days later, another episode unfolded. Mrs. Chua, who was seemingly channeling Teresita, questioned why Dr. Chua hadn't contacted the police despite knowing the killer's identity. Dr. Chua hesitated to act, lacking evidence and being unfamiliar with the name Alan. However, as the voice through Mrs. Chua divulged that Alan had stolen Teresita's jewelry and given it to his girlfriend, the couple overcame their doubts and decided to inform the police. Initially skeptical, the police weren't keen on pursuing what seemed like a ghost story. However, Joseph Stachula, the lead detective, decided to explore the unusual lead due to their lack of progress in the case. They investigated further and noted the previous connection between Alan Showery and the initials A.S. in Teresita's note. Upon checking their records, they found that Alan had passed convictions for robbery and sexual assault. He also worked as a technician in the same hospital department as Teresita. Inquiries at the hospital revealed that Teresita had asked Alan to repair her TV, reportedly scheduled for the evening of her murder. Though the source of this lead was unconventional, the details began to align. Alan denied all accusations, claiming he was at home with his girlfriend at the time of the murder. Despite his denials, the police were compelled to bring him in for further questioning due to the mounting coincidences. When police questioned Alan about fixing Teresita's TV, he began to falter. He confessed he had visited her home that evening, but claimed he left quickly because he couldn't fix the TV, and then returned home to address some electrical issues. However, when the police asked his girlfriend about the supposed home repairs, she expressed confusion, saying there were no electrical problems. Sensing a breakthrough, the police encouraged Alan's girlfriend to cooperate, explaining their suspicions. They questioned her about any recent gifts of jewelry from Alan, particularly in February, around the time of Teresita's murder. She recalled receiving jewelry from him as a belated Christmas gift. To verify, the police asked her to bring all her jewelry to the station. Astonishingly, the items matched those reported stolen from Teresita's home the night she was killed. Confronted with this evidence, Alan ultimately confessed to the murder, overwhelmed by the mounting evidence against him. Some skeptics struggle to believe the story of possession and suggest that Mrs. Chua might have had more knowledge about the crime than she revealed. They theorize that she could have invented the possession narrative as a way to inform the police without implicating herself. Considering she worked with Alan and Teresita, it's plausible she knew about the planned TV repair and might have pieced together some details herself. However, her specific knowledge that Alan had taken jewelry from Teresita's body and gifted it to his girlfriend raises questions. This precise detail about the crime particularly from someone not present at the scene, remains puzzling and adds an eerie layer to the case. Alan Showery confessed to planning a robbery on the night he visited Teresita Bassa under the pretense of fixing her TV, exploiting her request due to his financial troubles. Immediately upon arrival, he attacked and killed her without tampering with anything else in her home. To mislead investigators, he staged the scene to suggest an assault by removing her clothes. He then rummaged through the apartment, leaving with some jewelry and $30 in cash. Initially, Alan pleaded guilty, 
but later changed his plea to not guilty, leading to a trial. His defense lawyer, William Swano, claimed Mrs. Chua fabricated her trances after being dismissed from the hospital, citing, Never has a man been arrested because of a vision. The first trial resulted in a hung jury due to skepticism about the supernatural element of the case. However, a second trial led to Allen's conviction for murder on February 23, 1979. His 14-year sentence was later reduced to four years due to good behavior. If you have made it this far, thank you so much for watching. What are your thoughts on these incredible stories of victims solving their cases from beyond the grave? Let me know down in the comments. If you enjoyed the video and want to see more, then check out these videos on the screen now. If you have a topic suggestion, please send it to the email in the description. And as always, remember to like, comment, share the video, and subscribe to our channel. I will see you in the next one.